Welcome everyone to our virtual pre-show. I'm Amy Gutierrez and I get to be your host this evening. I hope everyone has time to fill a glass with their spirit of choice and enjoy some exclusive access to a few Bay Area greats before we get the ball rolling with our show. And I know everyone is looking forward to hearing from not just one of the greats in sports, but a great man, Golden State Warriors head coach Steve Kerr. He's going to be joining us later tonight. Now, this evening, it's all about celebrating the transformative power a coach can provide to youth. It's also an evening to raise money and support giving every child the opportunity to play sports with a trained and caring coach. Throughout the night, you'll have the chance to support Coaching Core by going to coach.ggo.bid, or if you prefer to make a gift by phone, you can do that too. Just call 1-510-496-5117. In under-resourced communities all across the country, kids are missing out. But Coaching Core is changing that by providing youth in underserved communities with the opportunity to learn skills that last a lifetime from coaching core coaches. And is there anything more inspiring in sports than the Olympics? The determination and dedication of Olympic athletes is something we can all aspire to. We missed out on the 2020 Olympics, but we're hopeful to see them resume in Tokyo this summer. And helping to hype it up, please welcome Brandi Henderson, who will be interviewing U.S. Paralympic gold and bronze medalist in wheelchair basketball, Trayvon Jennifer, and silver medalist in BMX, Elise Willoughby. Hello, I'm Brandi Henderson, and I'm so excited to be here tonight at the Coaching Corps Game Changer Awards. I'm even more excited to be joined by Trayvon Jennifer, U.S. Paralympic gold medalist of wheelchair basketball, and Elise Willoughby, U.S. Olympic silver medalist of BMX. I'm going to start off by asking Trey, how did you get involved in sports? What was your journey like so far? Uh, so I actually started playing sports when I was four years old. Um, and this came after, you know, not playing any sports and watching my brothers and sisters play sports. We are a very competitive household, so it was one of those things where... I'm going to start off by asking, Trey, how did you get involved in sports? What was your journey like so far? Uh, so I actually started playing sports when I was four years old. Um, and this came after, you know, not playing any sports and watching my brothers and sisters play sports. We are a very competitive household, so it was one of those things where... I'm going to start off by asking, Trey, how did you get involved in sports? What was your journey like so far? Uh, so I actually started playing sports when I was four years old. Um, and this came after, you know, not playing any sports and watching my brothers and sisters play sports. We are a very competitive household, so it was one of those things where... I'm going to start off by asking, Trey, how did you get involved in sports? What was your journey like so far? Uh, so I actually started playing sports when I was four years old. Um, and this came after, you know, not playing any sports and watching my brothers and sisters play sports. We are a very competitive household, so it was one of those things where... I'm going to start off by asking, Trey, how did you get involved in sports? What was your journey like so far? Uh, so I actually started playing sports when I was four years old. Um, and this came after, you know, not playing any sports and watching my... Other little girls out there, and he just thought this would be a great thing that we could all do together. Um, you know, I was always trying to keep up with my older brothers growing up, so I was riding my little 16-inch bike around trying to keep up with them at the jumps. So it was something that we <laughs> thought we could do as a family and went out there completely chickened out. My brother and my um, mom pushed for, you know, let's go one more week, give, give her another chance. And I got my first race under my belt and have been addicted to sport and co competition ever since. I, I love it. I obviously still riding bikes today. My whole family got involved starting a volunteer BMX track within a year of us joining the sport so that we didn't have to drive an hour to the track every time we went. So they're still running that today. It wasn't necessarily a sport that I dreamed about heading the Olympic direction with as a young girl because I'd only joined the Olympics in 2008. But as I set my sights on that and um, came out here to San Diego, I've been training hard and enjoying the ride. Just as Trey said, it's, it's, it's quite the journey. <laughs> That's awesome. And I love that it was a family uh, and all, all the family was involved in that. Um, I know that probably made it really special for you. 
yeah, it, it was really cool. My parents always said they know they've done a great thing for a bunch of kids, you know, multiple times a week. And um, it, it brings a lot of joy to the whole family. So you both mentioned your families. And I hope this question doesn't, you know, get you guys in trouble at home. But would you say you have a biggest fan? And who would that be? Um, Elise, let's start with you. Huh. I don't think I'll get in trouble. But, um, yeah, I would say that... <laughs> My mom, for sure. I mean, my mom passed away, unfortunately, in 2014 from cancer, but she was always my biggest cheerleader and the one driving me around to practice. And before we had the local track, she was the one loading me and my brother and all his friends. So I was I was just along I for the ride that. trying to keep up. And yeah, she was the one driving us all over the place, all the gymnastics meets and that um, growing up. And uh they're, they're all my biggest supporters. They all have been to the Olympics um, and obviously many other races in the local track. Um, but yeah, I'd say mom was the biggest cheerleader. That's beautiful. Uh, Trey, what about you? Who would you say is your biggest fan? Yeah, so I think this one's going to kind of get me in a little bit of hot water, but not, not <laughs> too much. So um, I'm very family oriented. So my family is definitely number one. Uh, you know, mom, dad, sisters, brothers. So, so everyone's been there. And then, you know, I, I meet this lovely woman at college. And then, you know, she's along for that ride with me. She's been there with me throughout college, throughout my professional career. So so then you kind of you're kind of like, yeah, you know, she's she's my number one fan. And and and, and I, I tip my hat off to her because she's always in the gym with me. And uh, recently in 2019, when uh, we had two beautiful children be able to have them in the practice facility with me you know when when things were open uh, it, it was awesome to have um and something that won't be replaced so you know throughout my life i, my, I feel like my number one fan has changed uh but i would definitely <laughs> say that the the kids are our number one fan at this point in time oh that's awesome i mean who wouldn't love an olympic dad i mean that's so <laughs> cool exactly <laughs> you, you, you're daddy daddy i mean it's hard to <laughs> it's hard for your heart not to melt, right? So now, are they allowed to see the medals, or you know, I, I won't say play, but are they allowed to touch them, or? <laughs> you know what? Funny story. I, I, I'm not gonna lie. So after we win in Tokyo, first gold medal that you know Team USA has won in 28 years in wheelchair basketball. So this is a big deal, right? And I, I let my daughter hold it, and at this point, she's uh, what is she? She's one years old at this time. Right. So she's holding it. Right. And then all she does is touches it. And the next thing you know, boom, it fell on the floor. I was like, oh, oh, oh. I was like, oh, but all in all, it was great. But Mama Bear keeps all the medals hidden, even from myself at this point. So <laughs> that's awesome. It totally makes sense. I, I, I get that. I feel like that that makes the most sense um, when you have those medals in the house, especially with little ones running around. <laughs> So again, we're here tonight celebrating all the coaches out there, and I would love to know from both of you, who would you say is one of your most influential coaches, and at what age did you meet them? Uh, Trey, I'll start with you. Uh, so for me, I wouldn't even say that there's one coach. I, I like to tell people I'm coached by committee, and the reason I say that is because when I first got my start at the age of four, uh, you know, my coach Bill Green gave me the opportunity to play. So like, I didn't have this opportunity to actually be out and, and play against peers and be able to travel and do the things that I love to do. So he kind of taught me uh, what it's like to have adversity against you, you know, people betting against you at that point in time and being able to focus on the goal. You know, I, I think I grew just as an athlete, m even more so as an individual and as a leader. And I think I've become a better player. And again, like I said, these are some things that we've learned on the court and while training, but this is something that I can introduce in regards to my actual life and, and my daily jobs. So, I think that I can echo a little bit of what Trey said. And I mean, you want to be a coachable athlete. I think that's one of the biggest things too. You need to be a coachable athlete so that you can take on things from these different people and their different styles. If for different parts of the game, if you want to be well-rounded, you need to be able to take new ideas and have an open mind. Um, and run with it. So I think that 
no matter how good you get at something, there's always in gymnastics, you know, you're always striving for that perfection. So I think uh, you never really reach that. And I think that's a, a good thing to instill. You're not entitled to, to anything, no matter how hard you work, there's always more to be done, I guess. And I think that's a good thing that I learned from a young age and carried with me throughout my career. Now we get into not only probably the most influential coach for me, but also just influential person in my life. I guess you could argue maybe even my biggest cheerleader alongside my mom, uh, my husband, who is now coaching me um, since just after the 2016 Rio Games. And now more than ever, I am, you know, we are just a team and it's, you know, you're doing it for more than yourself out there. And I think that, you know, just feeling like you've got that unwavering support in your corner. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And I'm sure it's amazing to share those moments together. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what happens in Tokyo. And it's, it's even more interesting for me to know that your husband is your coach. Like, that, yeah. that's really awesome. And that's a beautiful love story. Yeah, I think it's pretty <laughs> cool great. just to know that, you know, he's been there and done that, all those same things. So he knows exactly right. the emotions you're going through and the wave you're riding. So mm -hmm. I think uh, I think it's easier. It's easy for him to be cool, calm, and collected and, and know what I need and what shoulder I need to lean on that day. So it's pretty cool. So you both touched on a lot of the different characteristics that comes from participating in sports. Um, can you talk about maybe some of those key characteristics that you've learned from participating in your sports? Yeah, I think uh, it's sport is an incredible thing and it teaches you so much beyond sport. It's, it's unparalleled. And I think that even, you know, in team sports when you're a kid I think that's so important to learn how to work well with others and maybe you don't do things the same way and you know but there's you can still get to the same goal and you know having the heartache and having the joy and, and experiencing all of that is a good thing it creates a more well balanced adult I think and um, I'm thankful for everything sport has taught me and I'm grateful that I, I get to that's keep awesome. doing it as my job. Trayvon what about you? What are some of the things that you've learned? I think that's very well said and hit on a lot of the same characteristics that I think are some of the points that we learn as athletes. Having discipline to be able to be like, uh, at the end of the day, I'm not going to go out tonight because I have to get up early in the morning for practice, knowing that it's the sport is about more than just yourself, right? Especially for you know us athletes that are representing Team USA. It's, it's more so about the letters we wear across our chest, you know, the people that we represent, you know, our families, our name, you know, the United States of America. And that's what I hold pride in, knowing that, you know, when I go to the gym, I'm competing for my family. I'm competing for my country. I'm competing for the other 11 guys that are on my team trying to win, you know, the ultimate goal that comes around once every four years. And for some people, uh, once in a career. So uh, having that discipline to go in, in and out of the gym and having to make sacrifices, because I think one of the things that people don't know about us athletes is that we continue to make sacrifices, uh, you know, throughout our life. Sometimes you might miss birthdays or, you know, baby's first words because you're in the gym or because you're at a competition, but also say, staying mentally, mentally tough, uh, understanding that it's, it's a roller coaster. You know, you, when you win, you got to learn from when you win. And um, or when you lose, you have to learn from when you lose just as so much as you learn from your win, um, but not getting too high when you win, uh, because it'll be easy to knock you off because everyone's gunning for you at that number one spot. So it's it's being able to stay disciplined, but also being able to ride the waves of uh, emotions that come with winning and losing. But I think it's also important. Uh, everything that Trey was saying is so true. And but I think that something's important to note is that, that those per se, sacrifices are, are our choices. We enjoy doing that and we love doing what we're doing and that's why you do it. And I think that just because something's hard doesn't mean you don't enjoy it. And I think those are the lessons that, you know, people um, need to embrace and to accept, you know, everyone is good at different things. Like when we, when we walk into the village at an Olympics, you see every body type, every type, like, everything and learning to accept 
everyone has a place and everybody is good at something different. And I think being able to stay in your lane and know what you're good at and having the security to, to, to do that, like he was saying, and stick to the plan. Um, those are, those are all so important um, off the court as well. So we've talked about a little bit of everything so far from coaches to, you know, why are sports so important to us on and off the field? Uh, can you all tell me a, a moment where maybe it was your most mem memorable moment or your favorite moment in your professional careers? Uh, Trayvon, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, so I'm going to give you this long-winded story real quick. So, yeah, I, I feel like when I was growing up, I used to watch the, the Olympics on TV, right? And you would look at these people and you'd be like, you know, why are they crying? You know, you just won gold, silver, bronze. You just won a medal. You should be, you know, happy. Or, the, you know, you got the national anthem playing and they're always crying. And um, I remember being up on the podium and, you know, they, they put the gold medal around your neck. We're all good. We're all celebrating. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the flag is being raised and you're hearing your national anthem. And at that point, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm about to cry. I was like, I can't cry. Like, I, this is what I like. Uh, this is what I used to like. Why are you crying? Um, but it's the flood of emotions that you get, you know, after being able to to capture, you know, that thing that you've been chasing for so long. When you hear that national anthem and you hear, you know, the fans and and all of the 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 hype that's surrounding the games, it's it's just an awesome feeling to know that like you were able to do this for something like I said before so much more than yourself so I think like being able to have all of those emotions just like pour out of yourself at that one entire moment like it, it's an awesome feeling I couldn't imagine not crying in a moment like that I, I don't blame you at all but I didn't cry I want to I want to go on record to say I didn't cry <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you weren't the only one out there with some tears rolling down <laughs> Elise, what about you? Tell us about one of your most fond or favorite memories in your career. Oh, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that, you know, just, just as you learn from every coach, you kind of learn from every experience, win, lose, or draw um, in sport. And I think that for me, it's always about the journey up to, like, like, what Trey was saying that, you know, that flood of emotions you get on a podium when you stand there and you kind of, it's like the culmination of all that hard work and, and the time you've put in with the team of people around you that ha have helped you get there. I think it's bigger than you. You know, it's every single race has a story or every single competition, there's a backstory to what led there that, you know, not everybody knows only the ones who live it know it and I think that that's what you feel and that's what you remember and that's what you cherish when you do get the results and you're on the podium and you get to celebrate with those people or you get to cry with those people and work towards something better but either way just that all-in mentality um, and doing it you're gonna remember all of these things um, when you're you know lined up in the starting gate like that all comes together then. And I think those memories are what stand out to me and what, you know, 30 years from now I'll be telling my, my kids about, and, um, you know, just, just remembering, I think, I think it's all the journey leading up to those moments. Yeah. I, I can't imagine what it must feel like being at that, that line, you know, right when you're about to, to, to start the race, take us, talk us about, you know, what does that feel like? Is it, just all those emotions wrapped in one and then you hear the noise go off. Like what's that, you know, do you close your eyes and take a deep breath? What's that moment like right before you, you go? It's the calm before the storm. <laughs> it's, uh, it really is. And it's, it's quiet, you know, like as loud as it is, say, you know, the fans are going, there's such atmosphere always, at, at, especially say in Olympic games, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the crowd's going wild. They're announcing everyone's names and, um, you're lining up and then all of a sudden it is silent and that's why when you get on the podium it all comes out because you're learning to control those emotions um as you're doing things because if you let them overcome you too soon or uh, you know you just things don't you tend to go your way so i think you're always training to kind of 
be calm in that moment. And everyone has their own routines as to how they, they get in that place and get their game face on. Um, some people just feed into the noise in the crowd and they love that. Some people are taking a deep breath. But I mean, at the end of the day, that's those are those quiet moments where all the work you put in, like you're the only one up there to do the job at that point. So it's you in that moment. And I think uh, it's a pretty special feeling. I, I love I love the way that you characterize that because like when I'm on the way, because, you know, some nine times out of 10, we have to bus our way to our venue. Uh, for me, I'm almost the same way. Like I put it in my headphones and I don't want to be bothered until it's time to go because it's like I, I don't want to think about the game. I don't want to think about the play. I don't want to think about anything. I just want to just go into the game, like not feeling, not not thinking, not just just to play the game as fluidly as it comes to yourself, as if you are in practice, right when you're at your most comfortable. All right. So again, we're here at the Coaching Corps Game Changer Awards, um, and I would love for you all to uh, maybe tell the folks in the audience what do you think is a, a key characteristic that a good coach will have. I guess I would say that. A coach, in my mind, is just someone that can reach you to make you a better version of you. Like, you might not always agree with how they go about things, but if if they can figure out a way to get through to you and get the best out of you, um, I think you need to appreciate all different styles and types of coaching. And I think it's a, a real true skill and ability to be able to um, – kind of adapt athletes to the mentality and get the most out of them because obviously every individual is different and I think that great coaches will um, find a way to get the most out of their athletes. I 100% agree because being able to be a coach you have to be able to adapt to different personalities that you're going to have. You're not going to run into nine times out of 10, you're not going to run into the same athlete that needs the same motivation as other people mm -hmm. need. And I think that being able to get your team together to play as one um, is very important. And having that top leadership helps having that coach to be able to, to, to gear you up and get ready for that game, but to always, to, but to also have the ability to, to knock you down a peg or two when you need to be knocked down, um, to, to make sure that you stay focused on the task at hand. Yeah. Well, Trayvon and Elise, thank you so much for joining us today. We really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure everybody else did as well. We wish you nothing but the best of luck in these next months ahead in the Tokyo and go to the USA. What an opportunity to get a chance to talk to Olympic athletes. Wow, good luck to you in Tokyo. The world will be watching and we'll all be rooting for you. Next, Brody Brazil from NBC Sports Bay Area is joined by Oakland A's skipper for the past 10 years, the cool, the calm, and competitive Bob Melvin and the Bay Area's own my favorite player all time, the 1989 Oakland A's World Series MVP, Dave Smoke Stewart. Brody, take it away. Stewart. Brody, take it away. Amy, thank you so much. And may I remind everybody that pitchers and catchers report tomorrow for the Oakland A's. So Bob Melvin, a busy man right now. Uh, Stu's always busy. Uh, but I'm fortunate enough to call these guys friends and to chat with them here for the Game Changer Awards. And, and Bob, let me begin with you. Uh, you went through a pandemic season last year with the Oakland A's. Yourself as manager and your coaching staff, what did you guys learn that maybe youth coaches or amateur coaches could benefit from in terms of the season they're about to have? <clears throat> Seems like Bob may not hear us right now. Stu, can you hear us? All right, Dave Stewart may not be able to hear us either. Amy, can you still hear me? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, Brody. Right, well, uh, I'm with you, Brody. Until the guys are ready. Uh, until the guys are ready. You I'm want me here. to tell you about You're how here. Dave Stewart was my favorite player? Dave Stewart was my favorite player. <laughs> well, he was mine too, uh, for oh. different reasons. But but uh, oh. but knowing him now, I have to say, is is equal to the memories I have from him as a kid, to be honest. And that's 
That's special. Not everybody lives up to expectations. He did. It's so it's true. So, <laughs> it's so true. And we won't name names, but Dave Stewart <laughs> lived up to expectations. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's a pleasure to Just have him. Just as good of a man as he was a player. A pleasure to get to know him across the last several seasons. He's joined us as an analyst for A's pre and post game live. So I spend more time um, than most people even know with Dave Stewart, um, or at least used to in normal times. Uh, but getting to know him has been great. And I also have to say, ten, he's been great. And I also have to say, sorry, ten, now I hear a bit of an echo of myself, but 10 seasons for the A's with Bob Melvin, that has gone by a lot faster than it feels like. You know what I'm saying? Or a lot faster than 10 years sounds like. I do. I remember it just the other day when he took over, mid-2011. mid yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's funny because I actually remember meeting you, Brody, in covering the A's in 2006. And Bob wasn't there yeah. at the time. And, and Bob wasn't there at the time. Run, and then this the whole run, I've been, been over with the Giants. You've been and covering the like A's. I Bob's and cool, and calm, like I mentioned, Bob's just that cool, demeanor, calm, competitive very demeanor. Very humble. Very successful. Very humble. A great energy with the players. A great energy with the players. And it's been really fun to watch. And working with Bruce Bochy for so long, he can't sing. Bob's praises enough. I was going to actually mention that. I, I would say one of the biggest highlights I've had working at NBC Sports was the opportunity to interview Bob and Bruce. This was five years ago, maybe, at the same time. Um, I mean, you're, you're talking about both sides of the Bay represented so equally from a coaching and managing perspective. Um, more than impressive what, obviously, what Bruce did with the, the titles and everything else, but what Bob has consistently done. And uh, I, he's been here 10. Yeah. I hope he's here another 10. Well, we are obviously having technical well, we difficulties. We are obviously having technical difficulties because people didn't tune in to hear me. No, or me, or me, to, or me, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> they wanted to hear from Bob I'm and Dave. I'm waiting for a cue. We I'm are waiting doing for this a cue. We, so we are doing this virtually, so we hope that people will just be patient, with us, will just be patient with us as we work out those virtual kinks that we've all become so accustomed to over the past year. We, I'm wearing sweatpants right now, if that, if that also helps you. We are going to move on to our next <laughs> segment, and Brody, we're going to hope to come back to you. You got it. No problem. Okay. All right. Okay. So, with that, we uh, want bring to bring in 49ers uh, defensive end Eric Armstead, who was a presenter at our event last year, and he was so moved by our mission, he had something to say tonight. Here's a look. Hi, my name is Eric Armstead of San Francisco 49ers, and I want to say uh, welcome to you guys. Thank you for being here. I'm really happy to be here again. In 2019, I was able to honor my coach at a coaching core event. Coach Catalico meant a lot to me in high school, really built a foundation for me, you know, moving forward in my football career. And I learned so much from him in terms of how to be a leader, how to um, set an example for the rest of my teammates and the rest of my peers on and off the campus in high school. And so I was really honored and, and humbled to be able to uh, show some appreciation towards him and uh, really honor him in the way he should be. And learning more about coaching core that night and seeing all the other coaches honored and how big of an impact other coaches have had on athletes' lives and how much change that has had in our society and in our communities was amazing to see. And amazing to learn and hear the stories of others that evening. You know, kids get bombarded with messages from their parents and guardians all the time, um, and they're not so receptive. But to have that uh, those messages drilled in from other people outside of their household, like coaches, is also super important because their their ears are a little more open. Uh, sometimes they can be shut off to their parents, and so. To have supportive coaches in those times of need that kids can confide in and talk to when they're young and, you know, there's a lot going on in their life, anxiety from school, anxiety from sports, pressure to succeed. There's all different types of things that kids go through and coaches can be there for them. I want to send a special thank you to Coaching Corps. Being a part of the event last year and being able to learn more about Coaching Corps and the organization uh, was truly inspiring for me. Um, the fact that you provide and support coaches and role models in youth's life um, is, is extremely important and it doesn't go unnoticed. And so I want to say thank you. Um, if it wasn't for you, a lot of our youth would be lost without guidance and role models and, and, and people to look up to. So in closing, I want to thank you uh, for attending this event 
And uh, I can't wait to hear the, the stories from Coach Kerr. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the event. All right. He's a beast on the gridiron, but a teddy bear in real life. Thank you so much, Eric, for your time and your support and your thoughtfulness. The Game Changer Awards is such a special night. I've looked forward to it myself for the past seven years. It's a night to dress up and wear something different than what I wear at the ballpark all year long, a huge coat. But more importantly, it's a night to be inspired. It's a night that brings perspective. It's a night that reminds us there's still a lot of work to do, but we need to look at the work being done. So thank you to all who have joined us tonight. We will definitely try and get Bob and Stu back on for you. We'll let you know if that's going to happen. And that was just the warm up. And we have an incredible hour ahead. So stay right there. Keep this link live and open. The seventh annual Game Changer Awards will begin in just a few moments with Steve Kerr and the first female coach in Major League Baseball history, Alyssa Nacken. When we get back to work, let's work to make sure it's not business as usual. When we open up, must be more open. Let's recognize that women have the same, same rights, rights as, as men. men. Let's stand together. together. Let's make things better. Let's change. Let's, let's change. change. Let's give 50% of the population 50% of the voice. Oh, you think this is just a community center? No, it's way more than that. Because when you look our community up with the internet, boom, look at Ariana crushing ritual class, Jamal chasing that college dream, Michael doing something crazy. This is the place where we can show the world what we can do. Comcast is partnering with a thousand community centers to create Wi-Fi enabled lift zones so students from low income families can get the tools they need to be ready for anything. Oh, we're ready.
When we get back to work, let's work to make sure it's not business as usual. When we open up, let's be more open. Let's recognize that women have the same, same rights, rights as, as men. men. Let's stand together. together. Let's make things better. Let's change. Let's, let's change. change. Let's give 50% of the population 50% of the voice. Oh, you think this is just a community center? No, it's way more than that. Because when you hook our community up with the internet, boom, look at Ariana crushing ritual class. Jamal chasing that college dream. Michael doing something crazy. This is the place where we can show the world what we can do. Comcast is partnering with a thousand community centers to create Wi-Fi enabled lift zones so students from low income families can get the tools they need to be ready for anything. Oh, we're ready. Hello everybody, I'm Amy Gutierrez. My friends know me as Amy G, and I can't think of a more friendly audience than the one I have the pleasure of speaking with tonight. Welcome to the seventh annual Coaching Core Game Changer Awards. Version 7.0, it's a little different this year. It's virtual. I know we've all become accustomed to meeting this way over the past year. And although it's not quite the same as getting together in person in the Fairmont Hotel, for example, you have to go get your own glass of wine tonight, but I think you can do it. We still have a really special hour planned for you this evening. We're going to chat with some of your amazing sports heroes your two favorite giants and two of my favorite people, Crook and Kite, and Warriors coach Steve Kerr. You'll get to meet some real heroes who coach kids in our community, and we have a chance to raise money for an organization that is more important than ever in this time of the pandemic. Before we get into our program, here's a reminder of the amazing people and moments we've had at this event over the past six years. Cheers. And what a coach does is he sees a dream, he helps a young man or a young woman craft that dream and then chase that dream. It means letting kids know they are capable of things beyond their imagination. And sports bring out the best in us. They bring out the passion. They bring out everything that's good in people. The lives that you've touched, the lives that you've changed, as good as tonight is, will not touch the scope of the people that you have encountered and made better. That's what Coaching Corps is about. It's giving back. It's spreading sunshine. It's making a difference. Of the message and the vision that he, he put in me at that impressionable age that I could do anything if I put my mind to it, and that he was gonna get the best out of me every single day. Coach, you saved my life. You did so much more for me than just be my coach. Be a friend, a mentor. You provide a structure for me. It is my duty to use my platform to empower the young women that I coach in every possible way. It is my charge to make them believe in the excellence that they possess and encourage them to seek it, even when the pathway is strewn with obstacles. The only thing he didn't have was knowledge, and I had all the knowledge. You had the athleticism. What a combination. I just wish that he was here to just see what I'm doing now because Coach Lynch is the reason I am where I am today. And at that point, I had no clue on how to be successful, but he knew. And so everything that he was telling me was what I needed to learn. I never had plans of leading a team, never had plans on being an impact player because I didn't see it in myself. But Frank allowed me to see that. He allowed me to say, you know, why not be great? Why not have confidence in yourself? I coach because Coaching Corps gave me my second chance. This organization was the breath of life I needed when I was lost and wounded. I wish America could see this show tonight. America needs shows like this and needs people like this. Thank you, Game Changers.
as you just saw, we've been honored to include some of the Bay Area's greatest athletes and coaches. And it is good luck to participate in this event. Steph Curry collected a couple more NBA championship trophies after his appearance. Tara Vanderveer became the GOAT in college basketball, the all-time wins leader, and Charles Woodson just became pro football's newest Hall of Famer. What can we say? Good karma, it pays off. We've also had the backing of companies who are pillars of our community. Our founding sponsor since day one has been the Levi Strauss Company. Comcast Xfinity joined us in year two to celebrate the high school coach of the year. And our latest MVP sponsor is Blue Shield of California. Here's what the participation of all of those terrific athletes, coaches, and sponsors has gone to support. What we do at Coaching Corps is we recruit and train college students and members of the community to become volunteer coaches, who we then place with after-school programs that already exist so that more boys and girls can connect with a great coach, a coach who can serve as a friend, a mentor, and in some cases, a great teacher. In this country, only a third of low-income kids play sports, but two-thirds of middle-income kids play sports. So our mission is to to level that playing field so that every kid, regardless of their circumstance, gets to reap the benefits of playing sports with a trained coach. We were seeing that sports wasn't reaching everyone. In low-income communities, they weren't getting the opportunity to play team sports. We provide them the coaches that go in there and these coaches know what they're doing is not teaching sports so much as using sports as the delivery system for all these other amazing lessons that these kids weren't getting and didn't have the opportunity to get. I really believe that for some kids, a coach can be their most important teacher. It's somebody who sees your best self and helps you believe in your best self and then helps you be that best self. It's somebody who can see that in you even when you can't see that in yourself. These kids come to practice with a big smile on their face and I feel like I've done what I needed to do by the end of the day. When they give me a big hug or give me a high five saying like, hey coach, like I learned so much today, thank you so much. I hope they all know that they made more of an impact on me than I feel like I've ever made on them. It's at a time when a young person is developing and you have an opportunity to give them core values that are necessary and needed to be successful in life. One of the things that playing sports does, it helps uncover who you are. And it allows all those qualities that help you succeed in life to surface. Because oftentimes, there's nothing that pulls that out of you. And sports can do that in a way that a classroom can't. So we need all of it. Many low-income boys and girls were literally being left out of the game. They never had a coach who could make that special difference and impact on their lives. It's why we founded Coaching Corps, to level the playing field for all kids. Can you tell why we love being a part of this event? And this year is really important because no one has been affected more deeply by COVID-19 than the Kids Coaching Corps serves. The physical and economic suffering in their communities and the loss of in-person school and after-school activities makes the mission of this organization more relevant than ever. Like all of us, Coaching Corps has adapted to meet urgent needs this past year, like getting former NBA star Antonio Davis and a group of over 800 Coaching Corps volunteers to hand out 90,000 pounds of food in his hometown of Oakland. But in the long run, it is our ongoing work providing coaches as mentors to young people that will be vitally important to the recovery from this pandemic. Throughout this hour, you can support this critical work by making a gift to Coaching Corps. Go to coach.ggo.bid, or if you prefer to give over the phone, just call us, 510-496-5117. Okay, on with the show. Remember, in just a bit, 
We're going to visit live with Steve Kerr, who will be talking about his own legendary coach, Lute Olson. You do not want to miss that. And I will be chatting with baseball pioneer Alyssa Nacken, the first woman to coach in a major league game. But leading off, we have the two guys you'd most want to have a beer and watch a ball game with, Dwayne Kuyper played for six different big league managers, including Oakland's own Frank Robinson twice. Mike Kruko played for eight different managers, including Robinson and the hum baby himself, Roger Craig. And after a lifetime in sports, including 30 years as a broadcast team, both know a thing or two about the importance of coaching. My two favorites, Kruk and Kite, take it away. Thanks, Amy. And uh, Mike and I are, are thrilled to be here to discuss the important topics of something that is close to us because of what we went through in our careers and also because of our kids, uh, the importance of coaches. Mike? Coaches uh, are the people that inspire us. They're the people that tell us not necessarily what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. And uh, we've had a lot of people who have helped our careers, both on the field and off the field in the broadcast booth. So, Kai, tell us your first coach story. Start with Little League. We, we were a bunch of farmers, right? And uh, so the coach was a farmer. And uh, all I remember is we had a, a, a kid by the name of Tommy Hoyer who said these famous words that I'll never forget. We're not going to win today. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the coach said, Tommy, you won't be playing today. You <laughs> sit right next to me. <laughs> That was my introduction to tough love coaching. And, uh, but I think the important thing for, for me when I watched coaches with my kids was make sure the coaches are firm, but also make sure the kids are having fun. They got to have fun. They have to have fun. Well, my first coach in Little League was uh, old man Stein Krause, and uh, he was our assistant coach, and he was kind of a nasty old guy. His son, Ronnie, was my age. Anyway, we were nine years old, and we both made the, the major leagues. We're playing against 12-year-old. So the very first time I ever played, we're playing against this team, Economy Reds. And Lester Marzak is on the mound, and he's a lefty who's 12 years old, and he's blowing cheese. And my first two at-bats, I did not swing the bat. I was scared to death. And after my second at-bat, old man Steinkraus came over and said, Mike, you can't get a hit unless you swing. That's really important in this game. Great advice, old man Stein Kraus. <laughs> Sounds like my first hitting coach in the major leagues. You got to swing the bat. Uh, I think the one thing that will close us out is uh, we all realize the importance of, of coaches uh, to our, when we started out as kids and uh, the importance of coaches uh, throughout whatever it is, whether it's little league, whether it's, Football, basketball, uh, and I can't say this enough, firm, but when they're driving home after their event and they're not smiling, then something something's wrong. They have to have fun. When I think back of all the coaches that I had, I, I, I'm just so grateful as to how I was uh, inspired by them. And I think those are the things that you have to remember. If you're going to be a coach, you have the responsibility to inspire, to instruct, and to educate that child about the game that you're playing. Let them know the importance of its history. Let them know the importance of, of development and hard work. I mean, those are all things that coaches do. And uh, we were all lucky that we had good coaches. And if it wasn't for good coaches, we don't have the career we had. It's that simple. And that's why this is so important is to what everybody's doing here tonight. And, uh, and I concur, Mike. And oh, by the way, Amy G, you're looking good. <laughs> Han, you ain't the G. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they never fail to make me laugh. Crook and Kipe, you have been the best coaches to me. So most coaches, in fact, some of the most important coaches, aren't in Major League Baseball or in the NBA, WNBA, or any other pro league. They're right here in our communities, guiding young people on a daily basis. And that's what Coaching Corps is all about, 
and it's exactly why this organization was founded by former A's owner Wally Haas and the exceptional and trailblazing and friend of mine sports writer Joan Ryan back in 2009. Here now is Joan to introduce the 2021 Coaching Corps Coach of the Year. In low-income communities all across America, the odds are stacked against kids and they're hard to beat. Failing schools, unsafe streets, parents trying to keep up, after school programs working tirelessly to provide a safe place to go. And now with schools closed because of the pandemic, access to sports has declined drastically, making this undertaking even more urgent. Coaching Corps coaches change the game to change the odds for kids who far too often fall through the cracks. And they're doing it in ways that were once unimaginable. Working with kids virtually, socially distanced, creating activities over video, our coaches keep figuring out, no matter the obstacles, how to be there for our kids. We're thankful for the ambassadors who are shining a light on the importance of recruiting coaches. So when sports do return, we're ready for every child. Coaching Corps is dedicated to training and supporting coaches who make sure that girls and boys in low income communities learn skills that last a lifetime from a caring and dedicated coach like our coach of the year, Laura Marquez. Let's take a look. My name is Laura Marquez and I am from Covina, California. Yeah, that's how I want it. Good job. I grew up with a lot of anxiety and I feel like once I was trying to figure out how to deal with that, sports were kind of really my outlet and I was just always super excited to go to practice because my coaches have just been super amazing my entire life. All right, remember, no putting each other down. I think it's really important to have that kind of third party perspective just because you have parents, you have your teachers telling you something every single day and yeah, you can have that advice all the time, but I think having that third party coach, you kind of see it, you see it from a different aspect and I feel like once you're able to build that relationship that's not a parent relationship, I feel like these kids really confide in me a lot more than they feel like they could have with their parents. Thumbs up if you're listening. Thumbs up if you're listening. Being able to have that discipline with them, but then also encouraging them to be the best that they can, that this is a safe space for them to learn. Seeing that progression with them over time, it was just really cool to see, just really rewarding. I love seeing that I'm able to give them that love and give them that motivation that they don't really get at home or get from their siblings or really just anywhere, but these kids come to practice with a big smile on their face and I feel like I've done what I needed to do by the end of the day. When they give me a big hug or give me a high five saying like, hey coach, like I learned so much today, thank you so much. Seeing that leadership build within them and they're only like 10 years old, it's really awesome to see that. So I hope they all know that they've made more of an impact on me than I feel like I've ever made on them. And joining us now live from her home in Los Angeles, it's our 2021 Game Changer Volunteer Coach of the Year, Laura Marquez. Laura, thumbs up if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what an honor. What would you like to say this evening? Yeah, just thank you so much, Amy. I mean, I this award means a lot, and I definitely didn't expect to be here where I am today. And I think... Every time I think of volunteering, I see it as a privilege, and I feel like not a lot of people see it like that, but I've been able just to provide mentorship to kids and just be someone who's constantly there for them because a lot of the kids that I coach, they've just had somebody walk out on them, so I wanted to be that person that was going to stick around and just be there for them. Um, and just looking around, you constantly hear about the problem child or how difficult it is to handle the situation or the quiet kid in the corner that a lot of people just kind of ignore. And it's really easy to do that because you can talk with the kids that are really outgoing. Um, but the problem child and the quiet kids are the ones that I really target. Those are the ones that are the most important to me. And they really just need empathy from adults and kind of reflecting back to the coaching core training, they have really good examples of what to look for, how to support it or how to support the kids and just how to handle the situation in general. So um, every time I think about my experiences, I think just all these different kids that I've been able to help and 
I remember two years ago, there was this little boy named Nicholas, him and his brother, they had never touched a soccer ball before, but their dad was just really adamant about them getting into different sports, trying new things. And I saw they were really hesitant. And especially Nicholas, he was the one that was on my team. And he just didn't know where to go, what to do. And a lot of the boys on the team, they would start making fun of him because they've all been playing for a few years or even parents at soccer games, they would say like, hey, why are you putting him in? He's not doing too much. And I think just having him stay after practice or talk to me during water breaks or come in early to practice, I would teach him different trill, drills, techniques, and just different skills for him to develop to enhance his confidence and improve just in general, everything. Um, and I remember at the end of the season, he finally got a ball passed to him. And we were super excited about that because nobody was ever passing to him or he didn't have the confidence just to even go out in the field. He was really nervous. And I think we definitely celebrated that and it was huge. And um, just kind of thinking back, I've worked with a bunch of different kids now so I can recognize different characteristics in every single one, but I definitely know a sad kid when I see one now. Um, over the years, I've shared just my connection with my own life with these kids i see myself in them and i just i look like them so it's easier to relate and just to connect with them um but i know at practice we always talk about what's going on in the home life what's happening with the family how are they doing what are they feeling all that stuff and they talk about i cry all the time i'm so sorry <laughs> um they talk about just abuse that's going on or there's a shooting outside their house and they just need to talk it out and see what's going on or they're talking about them getting bullied at school so we start talking about what's going on in the home life because that's where you can see it affecting them on the playing field and that's where you can see whatever's happening in a personal life it transfers on the field and so i definitely want to keep an eye out for that and every time i have these conversations it just reminds me of the reason why i do what i do today and it's just, I see my own struggles and I know often people see me as this really happy person, but it took a lot to get to where I am today. And um, <clears throat> I grew up with a lot of anxiety and it just, it led me to be um, just bullied at school or being suicidal in high school. <laughs> But I'm thankful I had sports and I had my coach, uh, Coach Walter, in high school because she just, she gave me the tough love I needed. She, she showed that she cared and that's what I want to be for the kids. That is and what you I are just for the want... kids. You are that for the kids. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I don't want any of them to go through what I went through or worse or anything. So. And are running around, it's really important for all of them. And it makes kids happy just exercising and doing something active outside. And so I definitely miss that with them. But I'm thankful I've been able to teach them empathy, leadership, and just finally get that confidence that they didn't have before. And so it's definitely been a privilege to be that person for them. So just want to give Coach and Core a huge shout out to providing me with this opportunity. And just thank you to everybody that's tuning in tonight. And yeah, just a huge thank you. Laura, your perseverance and determination is so inspirational, a true game changer. Laura Marquez, and a huge hug back out to you from all of us, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing your story and being vulnerable with us. More to come. Stay with us. It's virtual. <laughs> I got my cue. Well, wow, there is no more moving testament to the power of strong volunteer coaches in at-risk communities than Laura and her story. But the key is people like you who are watching, watching me not get my cue. <laughs> You're helping to make this happen. You help Coaching Core to find, fund, 
and train young people like Laura so they can work their magic with kids. And now is the time that we ask you to help make that magic happen. Many of you know this event, the Game Changer Awards. It's our biggest fundraiser every year. So far, thanks to your help, our coaches have volunteered 300,000 hours, touching the lives of more than 200,000 young people in under-resourced communities. And as Laura showed us, the kids there just need to see that people care and that a coach won't give up on them. So right now, we recommend you use two screens, keep watching our live stream on one, and use another to donate. That way, you can contribute, and you're not going to miss Steve Kerr, because obviously, nobody wants to miss out on Steve Kerr, especially me. Here's what you do. Go to coach.ggo.bid. That's coach.ggo.bid. Register there, it's easy, you're ready, and you'll be ready to give. If you have any other questions about us, go to our website, it's coachingcore.org, and you'll find a ton of info about us. And finally, if you're having a tough time connecting with us, or you prefer to make your gift over the phone, here's the phone number, 510-496-5117. Give us a call, we have super friendly people standing by to help. Okay, everybody needs a team, especially me. And when you're asking for money, it really helps to have a partner. And that's why I get to team up with Coaching Core CEO, Janet Carter. She's awesome. Welcome, Janet. It's always you're so awesome. nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Thank you. She always makes everybody happy. <laughs> and she gets to call out your gifts this evening and tell you about a few things that your support does at Coaching Core and in the communities that we serve. So. Here are a couple of laundry list items. You can give at any amount, but we're gonna start. We're gonna go big, and we already got one. Thank you, Gail Gender. Gail. Go, Gail. Thank you, Gail. Yes, we're gonna start <laughs> big, and we're gonna ask at the $10,000 level. So feel free to jump on and just begin dropping $10,000. We would take it, <laughs> and we're thrilled to tell you that your gifts will make an even greater impact tonight. This is fantastic news, Janet. Three. Three generous donors are matching your gift, yes. dollar for dollar. Thank up, you. Yes, up to $100,000. That means every dollar you donate will have double its impact. Okay, so let's James, get some perspective. I know, yeah, it's great. We can see it coming in. You guys yeah. are awesome. So Janet, you're gonna lend some perspective because I just dropped 10 grand and that's a lot of money, but it goes a long way with Coaching Core. Tell yes. us how. Well, thanks, Amy. Uh, $10,000 enables us to recruit amazing people like Laura to become coaching core coaches and place them with after school programs like Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCAs, Parks and Rec departments that are serving low income neighborhoods. Think about it some families spend that much just for one of their children to play on a travel team. A gift that size helps us train coaches for over 100 kids in how to use a season of sports to teach those invaluable life lessons like persistence, teamwork, empathy. Because the truth is, sports alone doesn't teach kids these lessons. A great coach like Laura does. I love that. That's so true. She's awesome. That was so yeah. fun to talk to her. All right, we still have more coming in. Thank you to Katherine Snyder, and Lauren, Lauren. Carey. Yeah. All right. It's fun to call out the names. Yeah, I it love is. that. Thank and you. Keep it coming. <laughs> keep it coming. If you have yeah. it, give it. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're going to move on to the next level just and to help guide you, to give you some advice on how much you could donate. How about $5,000? That would be awesome. And just a reminder if you'd like to pledge your gift monthly, or over time, just let us know. We're super flexible and we will set that up for you. So Janet, a little more uh, insight. When do you think sports, because we're in a pandemic, when do you think sports yeah. are gonna come back? And what is Coaching Core doing to be ready for the kids when they return? Well, Amy, economically challenged communities have taken the brunt of COVID losses. <clears throat> kids have been stuck inside for a year with no friends or adults outside the home. And one 12 year old, for example, boy that I know, he's trying to learn remotely on a bunk bed that he's sharing with his three siblings, all of them using their cell phones to attend school remotely from that bunk bed. So when kids emerge from all the traumas they're experienced 
as a result of the pandemic, they're going to need caring and consistent adults outside the home more than ever. And we want to be ready for them with thousands of trained coaches. We want everyone here to join us, to become part of the core. Our Be Ready campaign is recruiting, training thousands of people right now as coaches, and you can join by registering on our website and getting trained as a coach who's ready for the kids. And if coaching is impossible for you, a donation tonight or anytime is another way you can become part of the core and help us be ready when kids hit the playgrounds and fields again. Oh, that's fantastic information, knowing where this is going. We're watching the thermometer rise as we do yeah. this. We love it. Great. And we're going to move on to our suggested next level of $2,500. If you have it and can give it, we'll take it. We would love it. Mm. Yeah, and a reminder that your donation tonight, it's being matched dollar for dollar up to a hundred grand. That can do so, so much. So let's keep giving. Eileen, we just saw the thermometer go. It's very exciting. I have yes. a bit of an adrenaline rush happening right now. Yeah. <laughs> and don't forget, you can also go to coach.ggo dot bid to donate or you can go into the chat feature so those are all ways you can go now we're gonna talk about something very close to my heart janet mm. and that is girls and sports mm. it's a beautiful relationship one that i experienced myself i played multiple sports i played at the collegiate level and i have a daughter mm -hmm. who's 12 almost 13 next week she'd want me to mention that she's an <laughs> athlete as well and I've seen the effect that it has on her. How are girls in particular impacted by sports and having a fantastic coach? Well, Amy, research shows that over 70% of females who participated in sports go on to earn a college degree. And we hear from so many fe female executives, they'll tell you that they gained the confidence and learned so much about leadership and teamwork from playing sports. And that's why we strive to make sure that 50% at least of our coaches are female, because we see the enthusiasm that girls have when they look up to a female coach as a role model. And that goes for kids of color as well. Research shows that having a coach who shares some of your own life experiences has the potential to have even a deeper impact on your level of hope and optimism for the future. So we're making a special effort to recruit black, brown, and female coaches so that we can have a diverse pool of coaches for our diverse pool of kids. So, so important. You know, I've always followed the model, you have to see it to be it. We're in this great time right now where we're seeing women accomplish more than they ever have in sports. And I just can add, if you wonder how I can hang with big dogs like Crook and Kipe, it's from lessons in sports. Mm. I draw back on those often when I need to get back at them. All right, yeah. we, st we still, and we still get to hear from one of my heroes, Alyssa Nacken, the first female mm. to coach in Major League Baseball. So back to that number though, seven out of 10, you guys, seven out of 10. Ooh, no, Doug, Doug thank five you. grand. Yes. And Leanne, thank you so much. Jeffrey and, and Elizabeth Jeffrey Spalding. Jeffrey and Elizabeth, thank you. $2,500. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That is going to help so much. Okay, so 7 out of 10. I mean, that's 70% of girls that participate in sports go on to get a college degree. Just let that resonate for a second because it's a number that's going to stick with us. We're moving on. We're just suggesting a $1,000 level and a reminder that you can give at any level, any bit helps. We just hope that you'll give. So Janet, I asked you earlier how Coaching Court would be ready for kids once the pandemic is over. Hopefully that's very, very soon. Yeah. But what have you been doing for kids during the pandemic when they couldn't play sports? Well, our special sauce is volunteer <laughs> coach recruitment. I love and we sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that great coaches never leave a team in times of need. So we asked our volunteers to help with food distribution and blood drives and anything else that our communities needed during COVID. We got over 850 volunteers out there who also joined our athlete ambassadors, such as, such as Antonio Davis, Mar Marshawn Lynch, and Dave Stewart to help meet the community needs during during COVID. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, wow, the number, do you want to read off the number that we're at already? 87,000 and counting. Remember, Thank if we, you, everyone. If, oh, an anonymous for $25,000. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, we love you. Thank yes. you so much. Now, we're so close 
to $100,000. I didn't major in math. I majored in communication, but we're just shy of 13 grand to get that $100,000. It oh. just moved on me, and now I don't want to do that math, but thank you so much because I know it's increasing. <laughs> don't forget, you can go to coach.ggo.bid. You can call. You Thank you, Abby. Abby. Yep, you can go into our chat. There's lots of ways that you can donate tonight. We're yes. going to move on to the $500 yes. level. That's a level that's pretty doable for a lot of people at this point, and, and we David, really, thank you. Yeah, we really want to drive home the fact that we understand not everyone can volunteer to be a coach. You may not have the time, but you can make a huge difference with a donation tonight, and it keeps coming in. This is so exciting. So don't forget, you can find the link to donate in the YouTube chat, or you can go to the website, or you can call. And so, Janet, $500 level, uh, the single most important thing a coach can do for a young person if this gift, $500, is made. Well, let me tell you a story about Coach Colton. Oh. Coach Colton was a coaching core coach in Compton down in LA. And after a few weeks of coaching, he noticed that the kids would run after him as he left for the day, all with the same question. Coach Colton, are you coming back tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Finally, one day, he asked a young boy, Jamal, Jamal, why do you always ask me that same question? And Jamal said, and this is where I can say it with a, um, because nobody comes back for us. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, it really is. So the most important thing we can do for these kids is to come back for them, to be there for them consistently. A gift of $500 will enable us to ensure that our coaches are there for kids, particularly after the tough time that they've been having over this last year. So true. And this year has been so tough for so many. And that's what makes tonight. We just hit a hundred grand. Hundred, grand. Over we just hundred. hit it. And I was just going to say, thank you, Arlene. This is in the year of a pandemic where everyone's had to pivot some way, shape Ted. or form. Ted Griggs, way to go. Ted, <laughs> Ted Griggs. Ted, right. Ted, Ted, first name, Ted, middle name, Griggs. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we know him if you can't tell, but yeah. I just want to go off script for a second and and this is such a genuine thank you because we know everyone has struggled in their own way this past year. And it's been different for all of us, what we've had to deal with. And a lot of people have had to deal with losing their jobs and not being able to get the income that they have been receiving. And you're still giving. So I thank you. I thank you for doing that and for thinking of the bigger picture. Okay, so we're gonna open it up now. And I've been saying this the whole time, any level you wish to give, we will take it and Coaching Corps will use it for good, good things. And by giving tonight, you join the family, you join the core. It's a growing movement of generous people who want to level the playing field for kids in underserved communities and who know the power that a trained coach as a mentor and role model can have on a young person's life. So Janet, what do you hear most consistently from coaches about their experience coaching? What is the most important thing that makes them want to, what you said, keep coming back for yeah. Jamal? You know, it's the kids, Amy. They fall in love with the kids. Coaches will tell you they joined because they wanted the free training or they thought it would be a fun way to be part of the solution and to give back or that they had a lot to teach the kids they thought but ultimately they end up feeling that they learn more from the kids than the kids did from them. One of my favorite sayings, my most favorite sayings about coaching is when you coach, you teach. And when you teach, you learn. So in the end, it's the kids that keep the coaches coming back. So true. When you coach, you teach, and when you teach, you learn. Yeah. I will be walking away with that this evening. All right, it is time to wind down the fund, the need. You all have been amazing. We're seeing these numbers come in, $2,000. Julie McGuire, $5,000. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It, 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 it far surpassed our expectations, and we hope that this keeps going. So please know that you can still make a gift Aaron, of any size. You. I know, through the evening and all evening. And we hope that you will be inspired to do so while watching. Remember, all of your contributions, they were matched up to $100,000, but still keep them coming because oh, Brad, every, yeah, every single <laughs> dollar is needed. Yes. All right. Okay. So we're going to wrap it up. Do you, you want to say where we are so far? 
we are now at, oh. Oh. <laughs> it keeps moving, keeps, which is moves, good. It moves. We can't, we can't stop it, and we don't want to. It's <laughs> almost a hundred and we're just a few dollars short of a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Neither one Todd of us want to do Tracy, the math. Tracy, thank you. Yes, <laughs> we, we're really close to one twenty-five. Let's get that as high as we can. We have so much more to come, Janet. Yes. Well, um, thank you again to our sponsors and friends at Levi Strauss. Comcast Xfinity, Blue Shield of California, and all of you watching who are out there giving so generously on behalf of the kids who will play sports soon. Thanks to you, our deepest appreciation. You are the real game changers for tonight. You can continue to support Coaching Core was work throughout the show at the, the website that, um, that Amy gave you before, coach ggo.bid or at 510-496-5117. Thank you so much, Janet. You rock. You're a game changer, and I love sitting beside you and being on your team. Now, for the highlight of our night, yay, we're joined by Golden State Warriors head coach Steve Kerr. Yes, I just fangirled out a little bit. We all know Steve Kerr as one of the most successful figures in NBA history. He's won five championships as a player, three more as a head coach, and he's done it all with grace and humor. You know, this guy. When we called timeout with 25 seconds to go, we, we went into the huddle, Phil told Michael, he said, Michael, I want you to take the last shot. And Michael said, you know, Phil, I don't feel real comfortable in these situations. So maybe we ought to go in another direction. Why don't we go to Steve? So I thought to myself, well, I guess I got to bail Michael out again. Um, this is my, my first coaching job, other than coaching Nick's eighth grade AAU team, the Wildcats. We were awesome, by the way. We dominated the northern part of San Diego County. Asked me if Pogut was starting. Uh, I lied. No, I did. I mean, I, I lied. I just feel strange, like, as a coach saying, well, the Hamptons Five played really well tonight. Like, I can't, I, I, I can't say that, but you can. They, they ran two plays get the ball to Clay, and Clay get the ball. You know, those, those were the two, two plays they ran. But I took a look at the roster, and I thought, man, I got a big job on my hands. Um, not much talent. Uh, very little shooting. Uh, not much versatility. The defense was suspect. More than anything, just shaky character. I mean, look at these guys. It just gets old watching the same team, you know, win the whole thing year after year. Sorry. That was really arrogant, wasn't it? It was kind of fun to say that. Day. Okay, so you just saw arrogant is probably the word you would never use to describe Steve Kerr. And I don't even think he's going to like me saying this because he just gave $5,000 to Coaching Corps. But I wanted to call him out because he's awesome. He's very charming, as you can see. But let's go back. When Steve Young, Steve Young, Steve was a young player, wrong athlete. When Steve was a young player at Palisades High School in Los Angeles, he wasn't yet that self-confident adult you just saw. Like so many of our kids, to reach his potential, he simply needed someone to believe in him. That person, that coach who changed his life, was just beginning his legendary run at the University of Arizona. Well, Steve was looking for a place to walk on, actually. I called his high school coach and asked if he would set up uh, some kind of a scrimmage. My wife, Bobby, and I went in and watched him for about an hour and a half. And I asked my wife on the way to the car, well, what did you think? And she said, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I really wasn't very good at the time. I was kind of a late bloomer. But honestly, one of the reasons I, I did bloom was because I, I played for Coach Olson. I used to kid him that we'd put a telephone book on the floor and, and I wasn't sure whether he could get over that or not. <laughs> He wasn't the quickest of foot, but he, he was so intelligent. He was an amazing coach. He taught the fundamentals better than anybody. So I was just really lucky to, uh, to learn from him. Now 
Malcolm Kerr, the president of American University in Beirut, was gunned down in his school today, the latest victim of Lebanon's seemingly endless violence. We didn't want him to wake up in the morning to CNN and, and, and see this, so we went over and, and woke him up and told him it was a hard thing to, to tell him. Coach Olson and Bobby made sure that I um, had a place to go. I ended up staying at their house for a couple of nights. And, you know, he and his family really took, took care of me at a time when I desperately needed it. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him to go back to the, to the Knicks. And then when the, uh, when the Warriors job opened, I called him right away and I said, the Warriors job is open. He said, I know, I've applied, he said. To be perfectly blunt, he sort of laughed and he said, well, if it were me, I would take the Warriors job. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he was pretty matter of fact. He's like, well, that's, that's the one, that's the job. And uh, he, was, he was right. I absorbed uh, so much of what he taught me and, and what I observed while I was in school that a lot of what we do with the Warriors uh, is patterned after uh, the things that I that I learned from, from Coach Olson. I'm thinking of Lute Olson, thinking of Phil Jackson, Lenny Wilkins, Greg Popovich. I've been blessed to play for the greatest coaches ever. Standing on the stage as a, a championship coach, um, it was pretty overwhelming to think about uh, you know, the men who had, had helped me and, and Coach Olson, um, you know, was the first first person I thought of. You know, dedicating my life to, to basketball and being able to build a, an entire existence from the sport. Um, all of that began with, with Coach Olson. Meeting him and playing for him and learning from him uh, gave me the path that I've been on, which has been an e-ticket at Disneyland. I owe him uh, more than I can ever, could ever repay, that's for sure. Uh, well, I do not hide the fact that I'm a big fan. Joining us now, Pac-12 champion and Final Four shooting guard for the Arizona Wildcats and an eight-time NBA champion, the head coach of the Golden State <laughs> Warriors, Steve Kerr. I'm sorry I called you Steve Young. Didn't mean to do that. I was a little nervous. Steve, thank you so much <laughs> for your time tonight. It's a rare night off for you, and we all want to know what Coach Lute Olson meant to you. Well, uh, Coach Olson meant the world to me. You know, he, he passed away um, this past uh, summer, and it was a devastating loss for all of us. Uh, uh, so many players at Arizona and before that at Iowa and Long Beach State where uh, Coach Olson coached, uh, we all gathered, uh, you know, online basically to commemorate Lute's life. And, um, you know, there were literally hundreds of other people just like me who, you know, shared their stories and in terms of how much he impacted us. And um, so it really hit home to me um, and reminded me of the impact that a coach can make. And, and I'm reminded of that really every single day when I think about this life that I live, um, getting to coach basketball and, and um, you know, be the coach of the Warriors and to have built a life around uh, the game of basketball um, None of it happens unless Coach Olson, number one, recruits me to, to Arizona when nobody else was recruiting me, and number two, um, you know, teaches me the game, um, how to build a program, how to um, build yourself, how to build your confidence, um, your aptitude, how to build your, your fundamental base. Um, he taught us those things every single day. And... Uh, so I think about Coach Olson. I've got a photo of him in my office. I look at that photo every day, and and I'm just so thankful that um, I crossed paths with him because uh, if it weren't for him, I would not would not be the coach of the Warriors. I can tell you that. Steve, I just want to pull something out that you mentioned about building yourself because 
Coach Olson was known not just for building the player, but building the person off the court. And what did that really mean to you? When did that sink in that he was doing that for you? I don't think it sunk in, Amy, uh, for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, you know, you show up. I was 17 when I showed up on campus, just a, just a baby, and I uh, was so happy to be there, but scared to death. And, and um, I didn't really have much confidence in myself until probably my, you know, mid, midway through my sophomore year. And then I think, you know, somewhere during that span, I, I was able to sort of, you know, kind of be introspective and look back and think, Man, I've I've um, I've come pretty far in a year and a half, and how did that happen? You know, and it and it came from the daily work that uh, that we put in as a team, and uh, you know the the commitment individually and as a group to to learn and to compete and to fight and and over and over again every single day, and to go through all the ups and downs that uh, we all go through in sports. Uh, but to do so with a group of people who uh, who supported me, uh, it was just an amazing experience. So it, it took a couple of years to realize that my life was completely changing because I was growing. I was growing as a as a person, as an athlete, um, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, across the board. And, and so uh, you know, it, it took a couple of years to really fully realize uh, the impact that Coach Olson was making. Yeah, it's so special to have someone like that enter your life when you are that young. Earlier, Steve, Crook, and Kipe joined us, and they talked about the importance of making the game fun. You seem to do that even at the professional ranks with a lot on the line. Your team plays with such a sense of joy. Maybe not Draymond all the time, but most of the guys, <laughs> most of the time, but we don't always get a joyful coach. So I'm changing the script a little bit. Did you have a coach that was tough or hard to get along with? And what can you learn from that situation? What can you tell young kids that have a tough coach? Well, I think you learn from uh, from any coach. And, and, and I really believe that everybody has something to offer. You know, um, you're not going to get along with everyone perfectly, but um, if if you have a coach, there's there's going to be some things that come through uh, that you can learn and that you, that you can take from. Um, I definitely had uh, tough coaches. My high school coach was very tough, and Joy was definitely not one of his core values. <laughs> uh, but he was a great fundamental basketball coach. He taught me um, in high school. Um, you know, a lot of the fundamentals that, that helped me get to Arizona and, and become a college athlete. And so I think you, you kind of have to roll with it. Part of, part of being an athlete um, is uh, rolling with the punches and, and learning how to deal with adversity. And you're going to have some, some teammates you love, some teammates you don't love as much. Same with coaches. Uh, but that's how life is. And uh, just learning how to, to thrive and to function within all of that is, is really important. All right, so we have to ask you, and I'm going to throw you under the bus a little bit, but you played for some pretty iconic coaches in Greg Popovich, Phil Jackson, Lenny Wilkins, and, of course, Lute. So similarities, differences. I think um, the, the, the thing they all shared was they were all clearly in charge. You know, there was a a really strong presence with each and every one of them. Uh, and that's really important. I think a coach has to have um, a wisdom and, and, and a presence where the players know, mm -hmm. okay, he knows, he or she knows what, you know, what they're talking about and they can help me. And, and that's a coach's job is to, is to help their players grow and improve and get better. And, uh, the, the ones that, that stood out at the pro level for me were Phil Jackson and Greg Popovich, and a big part of it was their sense of humor. And that's when I realized that, um, that joy was something that could become a real core value for a team. And, and so when I came to the Warriors, um, that was one of the values I, I brought and wanted to institute. I, wanted, I want our players to feel joy every time they come in to the gym 
and I was fortunate enough to uh, to inherit a player named Steph Curry who completely embodies joy uh, on the basketball court. And um, it's been one of the most rewarding things for me is to to coach our group and to 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 come to this uh, realization that uh, you can you can win at the highest level and behave like a a little league team, you know, going out for ice cream after a big win. You can do all that um, with the right people, the right atmosphere, but it has to be unique, you know, and and that's what I learned. Every coach has to be unique to himself or herself uh, because the players will sense uh, whether it's it's real or not. And uh, this has been such an amazing experience for me to coach the Warriors because of just the quality of, of players and people who I've been able to associate with and um, just an absolute blessing. And I, I truly believe what Laura Marquez mentioned earlier, which is that as a coach, you end up learning more from your, your athletes than they learn from you. I 100% believe that. Well, we just adore you. Your joy transcends from the court to the fan base. And we talked earlier tonight about good karma, and I believe you have it. And I believe that's why you've been able to play for such great coaches and have such great players. We are so grateful for your time tonight. I know you have a job to do, so we're going to let you do it. Thank you to Steve Kerr. What a privilege to have Steve Kerr with us tonight. We so deeply appreciate the support of Steve, his donation tonight, and the Warriors, and the highly visible presence of all of Northern California's sports teams over the past seven years. But this event also requires the less visible efforts of dozens of people whose work makes this event possible. They are some of the unsung heroes of Coaching Corps, and we unfortunately lost one of them this year, our very dear friend, Tom Pellack. experience. Tom was one of our favorite people. He made a big impact on Bay Area sports and this event. And he will be so greatly missed by his NBC Sports Bay Area and Coaching Corps family. In his honor, the Giants and the A's have decided to name the trophy awarded to the winner of their annual series, the Tom Pellack Memorial Bridge Trophy. We are honored to have Tom's wife, Tara, watching our show tonight. Tara, we love you. And we hope that the Battle of the Bay will now always bring a smile to your heart because we know how much Tom loved the game. Thank you, Tom. All right, I'm gonna get it together. And speaking of the Bridge Trophy, when the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's faced off last July, history was made, not by a no-hitter or a walk-off home run, but by a coach. Her uniform is now in the Baseball Hall of Fame. That's right, I said her uniform. <laughs> Alyssa Nackett at first page. We went. I had an interview with uh, Alyssa early on. When you were a kid, did you ever think you were going to be a trailblazer? First woman ever to be a coach at big league level? And uh, she said, no, I, I didn't. So what were some of the reactions of your teammates at Sac State when they announced that you'd be part of a big league coaching staff? Well, she, she said, they were great. They weren't surprised. No. And as we've gotten to know her, we're not surprised either. No. That is Alyssa Nacken coaching first base for the Giants against the A's on July 20th, 2020. The number 32 jersey she wore that day is now in Cooperstown as an example for young girls 
and boys of what can be accomplished when one doesn't pay attention to barriers and pushes through with grit and determination. Alyssa learned those lessons as a three-sport athlete in Woodland, California, and from her Connie Mack softball coach, Gabe Abelia. I started playing for Gabe when I was nine and a half or 10 years old. So I played under him uh, throughout like my, all my teenage years. She was real goofy, uh, but always had a win willingness to learn and improve whatever, whatever she could. I knew that I could go to Gabe about anything that was going on in my life. There's something about being 14, 15 years old and everything your parents say just doesn't make as good of sense. And so Gabe was the one that I went to during some of my hardest times growing up. And he just made me see and believe in the strength that I have within myself. 2014 was when I began the internship. The Giants had an internship open up in baseball operations and 2019 was a pivotal time for me because I was ready to take a next step in my career and Gabe Kapler was hired as the manager and I just started to like, you know, if I'd see him in the service tunnel or, or if we were in meetings together or whatever, I would, I'd call him Coach Gabe. And I would kind of like laugh to myself because I knew like, okay, you don't like call this new manager Coach first name you know but I just kept doing it and I, I don't know why it was just something that like it brought me back to Gabe Abelia and the memories and the lessons learned from him and it was about a month a little over a month long interview process and at one point in one of the interviews he said you know I have to tell you something like at the major league level you don't call a manager coach <laughs> and he's like so you don't need to call me Coach Gabe, like you can call me Cav, you can call me Skipper, whatever. And I just started laughing. I said, well, let me tell you about this guy. I think that was a huge, actually big part of my interview process for the assistant coach position with Cav. San Francisco Giants new manager Gabe Kapler has finalized his coaching staff and made history doing so. Alyssa Nacken has been named as assistant coach and is the first female to hold a position on a major league staff. It's something, um, oh my God, I'm gonna cry. Um, yeah, it's like I learned so much about coaching and just how to connect with players from Gabe and, um, you know, I, I've, everything that he taught me or that I just learned from being an athlete for him, I've taken into my career now. I was so proud to know that Alyssa, she's like my own kid. She had accomplished something huge. I went for women, you know, for society and for baseball. I'm really excited that a small part of the world gets a small introduction to Gabe Abelia because he's life-changing. Get your tissues out, right? All right, Alyssa is currently in Arizona prepping for spring training, but made time to join me on Zoom to honor her coach. Here's a look. I am thrilled to see my friend, Alyssa Nacken, who's actually in Arizona, getting ready to whip those boys into shape. We love it. How nice is it, Alyssa, to be in Arizona knowing that there's a, a sense of normalcy happening with baseball going forward? Oh, it's so thrilling. I've been able to be at the stadium. Uh, I was able to go there yesterday and just the energy that the guys have and our coaching staff has, it's just really exciting. And there's a lot of gratitude that we feel and kind of like this sense of being extremely humble for the opportunity to get going and have somewhat of a normal season. You've had good coaches around you your whole life. And tonight is about honoring one that made a huge impact on you when you were playing softball, Coach Gabe Abelia, and he is going to join us. And there he is. Coach Gabe, Alyssa has been raving about you 10 years playing under you, and you had a huge impact. First of all, I want to thank Coaching Corps for giving me the opportunity to publicly honor the game changer in my life, Coach Gabe. I was 10 years old when I first started playing for Gabe's travel softball team. We were never the team filled with the best players in the country, but we were a team that could beat some of the best teams in the country. Why? Because there was nothing in our minds that told us we couldn't. 
Abe taught us that every time you step on the field, you are going to battle for your teammates, regardless of who is in the other dugout. There is no excuse not to give 100% effort between the lines every single day. Abe had this unique way, something I tried to emulate every single day in my current career, of bringing out the most competitive, yet selfless spirit in the girls he coached. For the game of softball, Coach Gabe was teaching us the life lessons we needed in order to show up in society as quality and humble human beings who make positive impacts in our day-to-day -day lives. He was there for me as someone who didn't just pat me on the back or hug me in a time of need. He was there to push me outside of what I thought were the limits of what I could do. I remember a couple of times feeling stuck on the mound, trying to pitch out of a bases loaded, three and O count situation and wanting to be anywhere but on the mound. I'd look in the dugout with full puppy dog eyes, hoping to see him come take me out, but no, there he'd be leaning against the dugout railing, chewing seeds and staring right back at me with a nod and a clap or a chest pound and say, throw the cheese hop, Hop was a nickname he and another coach gave me. I would then laugh a little and regain the focus and get us out of the inning. It was in moments like that, moments filled with a little bit of fear, a dash of uncertainty, and a taste of hesitation, where Gabe helped me grow the most and instilled in me a deep confidence that I could do things I never thought possible. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you all an honor as my game changer, Coach Gabe Abelia. Wow, that was great, Alyssa. Just uh, trying to hold back tears. You know? Me too. <laughs> Me too, you guys. <laughs> Gabe, wow. what can you say? What's your reaction to what Alyssa said about you? Oh, that was amazing. I mean, I, I'm, I feel the same way about her. She's just been an, an awesome person. Yeah, it was, it's just, it's been an honor coaching her. She's, she's amazing. I, I love her like a child, like she's my own child. And uh, yeah, I'm just extremely honored. It means so much to me to receive this award. Alyssa is now somebody that my little girl can say, if I have to see it to be it, and I'm seeing her doing this, and now I know I can do this. So are you aware of the domino effect you've had? for girls all over the world in um, the confidence not, you instilled in Alyssa and where she's been able to go. Kids are seeing her, you know, at the point where she's at in her life, being able to coach a team like the San Francisco Giants, like, well, now they see that they could, they have, they have opportunities on they, they can actually get to that point. Watching, just watching Alyssa, just, I'm watching Alyssa going, wow, I don't, it's hard to believe. I, but I hope, hopefully I've, I've helped in, at some point in getting to where she's at now. Gabe, I love you. Thank I you so much for everything. I'm so proud of you, your accomplishments. And now it's your turn to coach. I'll be looking forward <laughs> to coach to watch you. All right. Well, I, what didn't make that interview is that I said that coach Abelia needs to get free tickets from Melissa to any Giants game that he wants to go to. He's earned it. All right. It was an honor to be a part of that. Thank you so much, coach Gabe Abelia and Alyssa. By the way, that game in which Alyssa coached first base, a six to two Giants victory. Like I said before, it's about good karma. It pays off. We hope Alyssa's story, those of Steve Kerr and Lute Olson, and especially that of our Coach of the Year, Laura Marquez, have inspired you tonight. They certainly have inspired me. If you haven't yet and you would like to help us with a financial contribution, you can still do it on your tablet, your phone, your PC. Go to coach.ggo.bid and click register now. That's coach.ggo.bid. GGO.bid. It's easy. You can also go to our website, coachingcore.org, to find out more about us or even to volunteer as a coach. And we still have phone lines open if you want to speak with somebody to help with your contribution. COVID-19 has taught us that kids need coaches and mentors now more than ever. Help us to be ready for the day when youth coaches can resume working face-to-face -face with kids across the country, leading them, teaching them, and just being there for them. 
I would like to mention we have raised more than $150,000 right here tonight. Our final thank you to all of our special guests, Steve Kerr, Alyssa Nacken, Crook and Kite. Thanks to the Bay Area teams who supported this event. The Warriors, the Giants, A's, Niners, Sharks, Earthquakes, Kings, Stanford, and Cal. Congratulations to our Volunteer Coach of the Year, Laura Marquez, and our other honorees. And most of all, thank you. 150,000, more than that, and more to come. We thank you, everyone in our audience, for your time and your gifts. And until we meet again in person at next year's eighth annual Game Changer Awards, I'm Amy G. Good night. get back to work. Let's work to make sure it's not business as usual. When we open up, let's be more open. Let's recognize that women have the same, same rights, rights as, as men. men. Let's stand together. together. Let's make things better. Let's change. Let's, let's change. change. Let's give 50% of the population 50% of the voice. Oh, you think this is just a community center? No, it's way more than that. Because when you hook our community up with the internet, boom, look at Ariana crushing ritual class. Jamal chasing that college dream. Michael doing something crazy. This is the place where we can show the world what we can do. Comcast is partnering with a 1,000 community centers to create Wi-Fi-enabled lift zones so students from low-income families can get the tools they need to be ready for anything. Oh, we're ready. 